everyone. Thank you and welcome back for this uh, next uh, panel of the second day of our summit uh, event. This is about the digital transformation for businesses and particularly uh, we deal with uh, the challenges and uh, diversity of situation that, uh, met, that are met by startups and SMEs in Europe. Of course, uh, we, we've heard uh, yesterday and also in the opening keynote today how important and transformative cloud computing is and how it is not only technological revolution but also with a lot of uh, consequences on the uh, economical uh, prospects for Europe as a whole. And we also know that any time that we uh, take a landscape view of the European economy then we always say that there is this uh, startup and SME as if it's a single world, right? That it is an important segment and 66% of the, of, the, of the employment, so it is absolutely critical. But we know that uh, it's not like uh, startups and SMEs are one thing. It's more like uh, a very, very diverse and heterogeneous grouping of small enterprises that will operate under very different and specific um, detailed context depending on their geographical uh, market of interest, depending on their segment, depending on where they are in the supply chain. So there are various uh, variables that uh, provide uh, an incredible diversity to the startup and SMEs uh, world. So this we, is what we are trying to, to explore now today in the panel. And so uh, I will now briefly uh, introduce the four uh, panelists that I thank already in advance for their participation. So we start with uh, Massimiliano Gori, that he is a product manager for Identity and Access Manager at Canonical. Then we have uh, Julian Fischer, CEO of Anynines. And then we have Mario Buchling uh, from Skylink. And then uh, Enrique Arizaga, uh, CEO and co-founder of Gipon Doctor SL. Uh, differently from other panels, I'm not introducing the panelists directly because I'm going to give them more time to actually situate themselves and their company exactly because of what I was saying before that it's easy to say startup SME, but actually every case is a very individual uh, perspective. So I would like to start with you, uh, Massimiliano, if you can introduce uh, your, your role and then... Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks Giovanni. So my name is Massimiliano Gori, as uh, uh, you said before, I'm the product manager at Canonical. I look after uh, the cybersecurity aspects and the identity part of all of our portfolio of products. Uh, and before joining Canonical, I was the CTO of, uh, uh, of a startup that was active in the cybersecurity space and actually saw some, some explosive growth. So uh, I can also, I also bring that, that task to, to the team. Um, yeah, over to my... My name is Julian Fischer, I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Anynines. Um, I'm on the mission uh, of automating uh, software deployment and operations um, to its full extent. And that's basically what Anynines is doing. We are building application development platforms for and with uh, our clients. Yeah, my name is Mario Büchling. I'm from Scaling. Uh, I'm head of digital business, so responsible for everything that we do within this uh, digital business environment. And uh, Scaling itself is a service provider for cloud and uh, digital business transformations. Hello, my name is Enrique Aritana. Uh, I'm the CEO of the Startup up uh, yeah. Doctor, and uh, this uh, main uh, the business of the Gipon Doctor is more oriented to the communication sectors, uh, more precisely to the fiber to the home, and uh, more and even more precisely on test equipment for fiber to the home. So uh, our experience on how to bring uh, the information that was gathered from the device into the cloud, and, uh, and also our experience on how to just uh, get people or hire people just to help us in that in that path. Thank you for the precise introduction, exactly what you said, Enrique, in particular, and in particular, and in particular, because that's exactly the point. In an SME, you have to have a very clear uh, hypothesis of where you fit uh, in the market, and that's where I would like to start with the first question for you all. That would be uh, about business model innovation or, uh, let's say, tailoring or finding uh, your business model within the, the ecosystem that you want to operate in. Because uh, we know that in the, in the European uh, Commission view, there has been a recognition that yes, research and innovation is very good, but then they also have to kind of follow up with programs and support also for the market go-to-market and business innovation has come out 
come across as an important topic. So, um, what, what's the, let's say, the level of business innovation or business model type tailoring that you see in your own uh, company and how important it is for you? And um, I would even say what kind of um, ecosystem support uh, I don't know, digital innovation hubs, uh, they should help uh, SMEs, right, to, 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 to figure out these things, right? So, uh, what's, your, what's your take on this? In this case, I would like to go around Robin, then uh, Julian first. Well, firstly, I think, um, from my experience, um, adopting cloud technologies in general in Europe is a bit harder than in other countries. Um, and that's a two-edged sword. Uh, for example, if you take GDPR, that also um, creates a certain uh, initial barrier of entry that hits especially small companies very hard. However, it's also a big chance because uh, if, if you want to you know, manage your own privacy, you need a legal framework to do that. So that's one part of the, of the challenges there are. Um, and the more challenges there are, the slower the actual innovation can get because the small organization is involved with that particular topic with a certain percentage of its capacity. Where well, furthermore, we just had that recently, a mid-sized company, well established in, in its domain, uh, wants to go all into uh, cloud operations and the automation of lifecycle management of the software they build. And their model requires to individualize and customize software uh, based on a framework and deploy it and operate it for several years for each client. So over the years, they accumulate uh, dozens um, of software deployments that need to be lifecycle managed. Now, with US-based providers, with their you know, reliable uh, APIs, you could automate that without being specific to the underlying provider because there are abstractions uh, to, to avoid buying into uh, they are vendor specific APIs. Now, recently we had a case where the where banking customers are customers of our customer, and uh, the legal framework requires, um, well, it's, it comes with constraints so that we cannot use US providers. So we've been looking for European providers that offer the same reliability and robustness, and. In offering that with an API, so the programmable data center, so to say, and we hardly f have been able to find a provider that offers a standardized API, such as based on OpenStack, that's reliable enough to run our existing automation against it. Well, there are many providers, and there are many good providers, but if you want to do that infrastructure agnostic automation, and you move away from US providers, there's a gaping hole in the European landscape. Sorry, when you say reliable, you mean stable API. So you know that it will not change. Is this what you mean? With stable, I mean that the services are not necessarily reliable. Uh, so, for example, if you're looking for an OpenStack provider in Europe, um, there are a few of them, and I think they are making good progress. But it's hard to get OpenStack done right at scale. and. Uh, you encounter many obstacles coming from OpenStack itself, but also from its, you know, underlying management. And I think if you if you look at the U.S. providers, it's mostly proprietary automation that they offer, because it's a hard problem to solve. And uh, the open source community, maybe with Kubernetes, will you know give it another try to offer an infrastructure abstraction that works with OpenStack to somehow to some degree failed on that mission. Thank you. Mario? Yeah, from my point of view, or our business model that's behind the idea is um, uh, keeping flexibility as much as possible. Because um, what we see is that even startups or SME have really a, a great starting point um, directly diving into digital business. So business transformation can be done much faster than, than in large scale companies. But in the end, it's no matter of the, the, the what or why, it's more a topic of the how. So how can I do the business purpose that I'm uh, yeah, trying to achieve? And then I suddenly see all of the possibilities, technologies, whatever. We see it here, even here outside of 
to see here and what's the best fitting technology for me for my purpose. So and in that case, most companies try to find their own solution. They want to try to do it on their own. They are losing time because they have maybe fear for some long-term commitments uh, that they have to do here. So very important is here, yeah, <coughs> flexibility, even in what you said, yeah, creating everything maybe API-driven, for instance, so that I'm always open for plugging into my solution, other technologies, new, new service, services, other offerings that we don't know currently that maybe uh, will be visible in the future. Yeah? So this is a very strong part, but how can this be achieved? So we need some operating models that exactly fit to this requirement. Uh, it's all done as code, so we need some knowledge, expertise, experts who are really aware of how they can do that. And uh, yeah, from our point of view, and that's part of our business model as well, that we always try to combine different solutions, be open for that, and use it, what's still given. So don't try to do everything on your own, you're just you lose, losing time. Uh, and for every for many requirements that you have, there are existing sol solutions. Use them. But what, what you have to focus on, or where our clients have to focus on, is to find a way how they can deal with that, bringing things to the, together, uh, combine it, and uh, yeah, be secure anyway, and fulfill all of the GRC requirements that are still there and still given. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my, uh, my points are uh, maybe a little bit different. We have started just, uh, or just getting all the information about, uh, well, let me just go back a little bit. We work with uh, tele telecommunications operators. And, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the main resources, uh, the thing that they uh, give them money is how to uh, provide the bank. Okay? The, the bank that you get from is money for them, it's resources. The bank is a resource and it's money for the company. Uh, so whenever you are having, uh, enjoying your services at home, uh, the performance of those services, they have just to comply with the quality of experience or quality of service. And this is just by testing different parameters that they, they gave us an indicator if this service is, uh, is having a performance correctly or if it is just complying with the SLA, which is a contract that you sign with uh, The thing is that they, uh, then they realized that they wanted to have something in the cloud. Okay? Uh, it was just not longer just valid to have in a specific device which it was not served by anyone. So if they wanted to open the data just uh, so that it is shared by the, the people in the company that they are the experts. So you don't need to have just some very specific experts located in any place, but you can just have it anywhere. Uh, so we need just to just to move to do the transformation uh, just to move the data from the devices into the cloud. Okay? Uh, that was very interesting business opportunity. We wanted just to go there, and then the problems came. Uh, the first problem was to find the right people to know with the knowledge on cloud computing. Yeah. We even just hired people. Uh, they just said that they were experts. In this case, it was Microsoft Azure, and the solution that they gave us was so big. It was, uh, it was very expensive. It was very expensive. And the second one was how to keep, uh, you know, the these telecom operators are very reluctant regarding the data that they provide. They don't want yes, to, they do not trust by themselves the fact. Okay. So it's, you are saying we are moving data, uh, important data into the cloud. This is private data, uh, but they need just so uh, you have to fight with them so that instead of how to move from on premises into the public cloud. And uh, we are still fighting. <laughs> I mean, we, don't, we are still not having a solution. So that's, uh, that's the way, the way for so, and we are a startup, so we are small. Uh, so that's continuously fighting. We know that there is business there. We know that there is a lot of things that we can do uh, That if someone is doing the things right, they will get a lot of money. But you know, the path to reach that is very, very difficult, especially for myself. Thank you. Massimiliano. So, I mean, many people know Canonical primarily because of Ubuntu, uh, which uh, is, again, the, probably the most popular operating system in the cloud. Uh, but, I mean, at the end of the day, we, we offer solutions across the entire, like, uh, uh, compute spectrum. So, from the IoT side, like, Ubuntu core, all the way to managed solutions in the cloud. Um, I mean, I wanted to, obviously, uh, say this before actually answering the question about uh, the tailoring. I mean, I do firmly believe that 
the approach that uh, needs to be taken to small and medium businesses is different than when we talk about you know the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, and you know we, we are first and foremost like a developer platform, and so that's why that's that's where we started, and that's where most of our energy is. And uh, we address that like primarily in two ways. So if you think of EOS, of course, uh, like Ubuntu is freely available like everywhere, whether it is on-premise and on the cloud. Um, of course, there are premium offerings uh, to that, but if you look at our, you know, 100,000 instances launches every day, like most of them are actually part of the feed here, and uh, most of them are launched by, you know, smaller businesses and innovators and people that want to experiment from that. And on, on the other side, as uh, like Julian uh, like mentioned, mentioned before, Automation is a, is a big problem. Um, so, just like launching instances on the cloud is like very, very easy. Like everyone can do that. But then, like managing the day-to operation, the, the maintenance, the upgrade, and like all of that is not, uh, it's not easy. And, uh, and and that's where we we are investing a lot in like tooling and automation, of course, all of it like open source, uh, to make sure that those problems are are addressed and. and uh, and we help like smaller businesses providing uh, solutions that effectively abstract the data and the application layer to the infrastructure, uh, so that you know if they want to migrate the cloud or like maintain their sort of agility, which is required in a startup when they scale up, then they can. Do it. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to pick up on uh, the previous panel, actually, and also what uh, Enrique briefly mentioned now when we when he talked about it. Yeah, okay, I hire someone and then I have to choose the cloud provider depending on the person that I was able to hire because that's what they know. So, um, of course, the gap is uh, across the board is a big issue and it is well known in Europe, but uh, I would say that for the uh, small and medium enterprises, I would really combine this with the talent management. Because in the previous panel was also uh, mentioned the fact that, well, it's not just competing on salaries, but it's also competing on loyalties. So if uh, a company decides to be ruthless with the employees, they, they cannot complain if the employees want to be ruthless with the company. And as soon as I have uh, another chance, they, they leave. So you have to balance the training with the shorter uh, permanent time of employees and so on. So I would like to hear from you what is your experience in terms of uh, talent management, uh, uh, finding the skills, and also implicitly competing with uh, larger companies that, of course, have the need for the same kind of profiles that you have in cloud computing. So in this case, I would like to start with Mario. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic, because as we all know, uh, we are not that much experts currently available in the market. So, um, yeah, one part is, I think the image that you have for even the, the, the younger generation, yeah, it's not that. Um, it's maybe a little bit different to how to hire um, real experts, senior experts, than starting with younger ones. Yeah? You have to be, you have to have a cool image, you have to give them the opportunity to work on this cool stuff, this fancy technology and so on. So if you say that you do it just, everything is outsourced yeah? and you are just managing that part that's really boring for them. So you have to be cool, you have to be innovative and you have to give them the perspective, the opportunity to, um, yeah, so that they can be an expert in the future as well. So you have to work with all that modern technologies as well. But uh, for us, it's very easy because as a, a service provider, we, we already do so. And uh, for that, we are really, uh, we really like it to work with uh, younger persons because with them, we can go together on our journeys and they all have the knowledge about how to use these modern technologies and they, they grew up with it. Uh, that's totally different to maybe uh, senior experts that are also necessary because somehow seniority is very important for large, large scale customers and for the uh, bigger challenges. Uh, but we need this young talent for really uh, uh, working on all of that innovative stuff here. Yeah. But it's not easy. So yeah, hire them, educate them, and do your journey with them and work together with them really on a uh, expert level even from the beginning. Don't treat them as a trainee or something like that. That's not the right way. Yeah. Thank you. And we can Well, uh, you know, uh, startup is uh, it's like an adventure by definition. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, in a startup, apart from just for trying to engage the customers, you are also always just trying to find investors. 
So I uh, don't have much time for any other things. So well, the only thing just to try to invite people just to uh, join with you, my capacity is just to be part of the adventure. And, uh, and also it's not regarding the salary, because uh, we are just still always fighting with the, <laughs> with the income. Uh, so what you offer is uh, to become part of the company by being the owner of the uh, small portion of the company. So uh, the, that's, uh, if he just has some, uh, some shares of the company, even if they are small, uh, he just pushed so that the company has then just go higher and at the end, if, they, if you make the company just uh, convince investors and also just increase the value of the company, this person will also increase the value of his participation in the company. So that's the, but I mean, it's also a trade-off because sometimes you offer them and you might not be the right person. Uh, later on, if you, if you need to fire this person, then, then that's also a problem. <laughs> so it's, uh, you need to, it's always uh, risk management. But that's the only way for us to start. Fair enough. Thank you, Enrique. Massimiliano. This one as a you know previous startup founder, so I think that the, there is like I, I listened to the previous founder and there is a misconception that you know outsourcing is is, is enough and like startup should outsource these kind of jobs. Uh, I think that's the wrong approach because what you actually uh, the, the technological choices that you made in the early days of a startup, whether they are good or wrong, they're actually going to haunt you for like the years to come. So you want to make sure that you build the right foundation. So it's crucial that you actually have in-house people that uh, make that make those initial choices. And now, I mean, of course, as a, as a startup founder, I think that hiring is, you know, the, uh, the, the most like the most important part of the job and the one where you should allocate, um, the, 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 I mean, the, the largest amount of time. So it's hard. Uh, I don't think that there is like a secret receipt for success, uh, but uh, the, the only thing that I'm sure that should be avoided is actually you know, just making rush decision and, and leaving those decisions to, uh, to, to other people. Uh, now, with my canonical hat, I think that the uh, a key to this, uh, like the answer to this question is obviously investing in the right automation tools from early on and embracing them. Maybe that means like, a little bit less agility in the early days, but it definitely pays off if you pass the uh, you know, six months, like year mark. Um, and also try as much as you can to separate the data and application layer like abstract that away from, from the infrastructure. Thank you. And Julian. Well, I think uh, I absolutely agree that um, hiring is on the critical path of any venture nowadays. Um, I would also agree that um, insourcing has been a trend in the last 10 years. If you, if you look at Netflix or Amazon or Google, they are not outsourcing the core business. They are insourcing that. They are building cross-functional teams they're following often. They're often following paradigms such as Kanban and, and Lean and, and Agile, where you know building a team and, and knowledge within a company is basically the center part of, of building the business. So I think when, when it comes to hiring, generations are getting smaller, and the new generations they have different you know values in life, and therefore uh, work must be more appealing. So I think right next to salary, where salary dynamics are definitely, you know, uh, increasing, I also think that a company needs a mission that is interesting and, and uh, somehow makes people want to engage with that mission. So if you provide a good salary and a good mission and the company does something that has a purpose, uh, I think hiring is a solvable problem. Um, we, for example, we also spend a lot of time in, in, uh, in training right from the university. So I've been giving lectures at local universities for, for more than 10 years. And, uh, and that's where there's a steady, uh, you know, that's, that's feeding the steady growth of our company to some extent. Because the experts, the senior level ex experts, are often taken by either large enterprises paying a lot of, you know, money on the salaries, and most importantly, venture-funded startups that have you know, a limited amount of time to build a product and therefore need to hire people so that you know, they, can, they, they can actually spend the investors' money. And as long as interest, interest rates are low and money is pushed into equity funds and then into startups, that dynamic will keep going. 
Thank you very much. This is, was very good uh, insight. I would like to take a small break and see if someone from the audience wants to ask questions. Please. Um, have you ever thought about or how is the experience when like bringing external com like external uh, people helping you to build up the knowledge within your company like having not only outsourcing and insourcing but also having like people from outside building up the knowledge for the younger generation have experience with that or isn't this really a way to go? Related to that. Uh, we are actually hiring uh, freelancers only and solely for the purpose of collaborating with, with people and building skills with them. We are not hiring freelancers, for example, to do work for us. It's exactly for that purpose. If you want to get access to a particular senior level experience that you cannot train with a reasonable amount of time, uh, hiring freelancers is a, good, is a good approach. It has its own risks, to be honest. Uh, for example, if people grow a strong bond to freelancers and they sell their freelance lifestyle to your employees, well, they're gone, but I mean, it's a risk uh, worth taking. They are suitable contract. <laughs> Little clause for that. Do you really want to yes, that's really true. Sorry, go on. Next. No, uh, I mean, uh, it's some more related to that. I mean, it's not like cutting experts, but uh, working in open source uh, or like adopting adopting like a, a community approach to the things that you do. I think it's a it's a very powerful uh, tool that I mean, of course, uh, you know, we have been leveraging for, uh, for like over over a de decade now. And uh, uh, again, like contribution, they they don't only come in the way of hey, someone has done like a pull request or like has given us like a bunch of code. Uh, but, you know, the, we, we see community members also contributing to idea, to uh, architectural discussion, to actually helping us understand where the future lies. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't know whether to call it insourcing, outsourcing, but at the end of the day, like, uh, it's a way of actually, uh, I mean, the power of open source is actually, like, allows you to, to get ideas from from a wider community and, uh, uh, and definitely improves the quality of our products. Some additional aspects maybe because um, we do it in practice every day uh, but the question is not if it is uh, or, or to gain most benefit of that you have to find a way how you collaborate with them so you have to work in a team it's not the way you you sell and, or you, you engage a freelancer then he is the trainer or the master of information and suddenly he disappears and no one knows what, what they have to do afterwards so they have to work together on a specific topic and then it doesn't matter where the expert is from can be from your company, can be a client expert, can be a freelancer, it doesn't matter. They work on a, in, together, they collaborate with each other and have a specific purpose right, why they are working for us. And that's, uh, that's probably well in practice. From, from my experience, uh, I, it's been very positive. I mean, one of the cases, especially one of the cases where, uh, I mean, you need to have, you know, very clear in our case we, we need to have a development it was very clear was pretty much divided we want we uh, really have in our mind what we need it so we hired that person for that specific job he uh, did it very well and we were very satisfied with that but uh, when the, the, then we make the transfer of the knowledge because you don't, don't you don't do the transfer so that your own people can maintain later on what has been done with that person and the um, experience so far is great, so very positive for myself. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the question. Any other interventions from the audience? Okay, good. So I wanted now to keep your mind on another, let's say, aspect that seems uh, very relevant for, for small and medium enterprises, which is uh, business development, networking, ecosystems, and so on. So, of course, uh, again, a small company has a niche, you cannot do everything, you can rely on a freelancer, the site of the player, they're related to universities, and all these, these connections, right? Which go much beyond just prospect, customer, and sales activity. Uh, what's your experience on the influence of cloud computing 
in this, uh, in this let's say, act or in this business constellation. So how did that change or, or did it change a lot the different kind of actors with which you have to interact during your uh, business operation? Or, uh, and, and, and w or what instead uh, stayed the same? It is relatively agnostic from the cloud uh, technological and uh, business transformation. And this, I think, it's a great care first, right? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, I, my answer was a little bit different from the other's perspective. Uh, we, uh, we have seen it's a change in the market. Uh, previously, we, are, we have everything in uh, hardware, we have uh, very powerful hardware when you get everything. And uh, now we are moving into a, a less powerful hardware and use the cloud. Just to move all the data like that. It's like you collect the data and the data is analyzed. Yeah. So the intelligence has moved from the edge devices into other things. Uh, not only just the uh, analysis, but also to share the data and just to improve in, the, in this case the management of this so parameters that I was mentioning. So, that's, uh, so it looks like uh, that, that for the in that industry, uh, we are, uh, the movement is just. Uh, just move it, just to have uh, everything. In fact, it's like they are becoming edge devices, I would say. <laughs> so it's like uh, you have like a small cloud, a complete cloud, and then they have just removed a part of the hardware, the, the computation and the uh, storage sources now, and they are in the cloud. And then you just connect to the computation. So there's a, there's a mis business transformation, the digital skills has been moving to. So that, and that's Exactly what uh, uh, this IT department they are demanding, because uh, you know they usually have the capex and the opex, and uh, so they they are reducing the, uh, the investments in the capex, and they are yes, I mean all the investment in the opex. And in order to do that, uh, you need yes to have all these things out. Uh, so that's the, that's the, the transformation that uh, we are we are seeing, and this is why. Even our own company has to transform itself. Uh, the knowledge of the people that we have in the company have also to be transformed so that we can just make the demands of the, the new one. Thank you. Asimiliano then. So, I mean, on, from the canonical side, as I, as I said before, like answering the question, the, the community element is, is like a key aspect for that. And, and we try we try to be like each one of us, uh, doesn't matter what you are, like a product management support, like engineering, like we. We try to give back as much as, as we can because you know, we realize um, we, we get a lot of contribution, but at the same time, uh, we want to like help what might potentially be our uh, our future customer or like people that are interested in, in developing the project. So um, I guess that's that's how we we address that element. But just going back to my previous experience, as I said like as a, as a startup company, my startup was focused on. Um, um, I mean, started on Asia, uh, and like, what well, so I remember launching my first like S3 bucket in 2007. I mean, if you know, fast forward to 2017, so 10 years after that, um, the amount of support or like engagement that I actually got uh, from from Microsoft was was actually a lot higher than the one that I was experiencing when I was in a large in a large organization. So uh, I think that. Uh, uh, I don't know about the other cloud providers, but at least for them, I, I can definitely tell that they uh, they invest a lot of time and resources in making sure that the uh, uh, startups, small businesses, they actually uh, are successful using using their technologies. Thank you, Julian. Then I would like to con reconnect to the uh, question of infrastructure agnosticism. So, if you're a company and you want to build valuable software, you need to be able to. Um, leverage multiple infrastructure providers. We have clients, for example, they have offerings across the globe. For example, if you want to offer your services in China, you're very likely to use a Chinese infrastructure provider, such as AliCloud, uh, for the measure that the entire service is encapsulated in that particular jurisdiction. So if you go to US or Europe, you will have you know other infrastructure providers, such as Microsoft or AWS or Google. So in, in, in any case, if, if you build a global service, you need to do that infrastructure agnosticism, or otherwise you'll have to build a lot of different adapters because these infrastructure APIs, they're only similar when it comes to give me, give me a, 
uh, a virtual machine or something. But they are very different when it comes to give me a message queue or, or you know store data in a database, especially if it's a NoSQL database. So at our company, in Edinites, we've built abstraction layers to unify that. So then you'd have to ask at some point where it, where rubber meets the road. And this is, you know, what is what is the abstract programmable data center about? And I think the most important paradigm shift that has you know, you know, influence this whole cloud computing thing is what you mentioned is that you'll have commodity hardware, not the best high end hardware anymore, but you separate ephemeral compute power, like the ephemeral virtual machine that can go away at any time, from the valuable data which is still stored on a high end storage server, you know, attached as a, as a remote block device. So that gives you the power to just, you know, let a virtual machine go and recreate it from a virtual machine image. And a similar pattern is transported into the container world of Kubernetes, where you have you know, persistent volumes and ephemeral containers. So, for that to work, the underlying data center needs to provide you with a reliable, reliable API to uh, provide virtual machines and or containers, as well as remotely attach those block devices in a meaningful way. So that's the very, very essence of it. And, you know, that, that means hardware needs to be organized in a particular way. And then you come back to the question, how do you organize that on a software layer, like OpenStack or having, you know, some vendor-specific API. So that's the core of it. And then you have automation tools that build on top of those infrastructure APIs. And you can only do that with a limited number of APIs because even if it's you know open source tooling like Bosch or Kubernetes, you still need to implement that automation against that API. And that's where where the problem is. Even if you have 20 or 30 different European infrastructure providers, like nobody is there right to write that automation for 30 providers. And that's where standardization is missing. And maybe Kubernetes will you know solve this problem to some degree. Thank you. And then Mario? Yeah. Yeah, what changed by cloud computing, I think, is that you um, really got easily access to very mighty and powerful services. So you can quickly start working with, with AI, ML services, and so on. In the past, you couldn't think about that. Um, but this leads very often to the situation that you uh, die in chaos. Because suddenly everything is possible from infrastructure perspective, from the car, car service perspective, or as a service, if you would use them. So, um, what we see as new actors are the teams, often called competence, whatever for center, cloud competence center, CCOE, whatever for, who are responsible for structuring all that, all the, the usage of all the services. So, they consider all the governance requirements, all regulatory requirements, and so on. Yeah, they will um, yeah, create some standards, some internal standards that have to be uh, fulfilled from the internal IT if they work on new services. Also from suppliers, this is the standard, why they, or what they have to use in creating new services. And that's the way why they can use in the end this new business services uh, even worldwide. It's worldwide business. But they have to follow all the same standard. That's the, the structure to avoid the chaos. That's, uh, typically um, probably by one of the services that I can use. Yeah, and it's not a one-time task, so it has always be adjusted, always be uh, yeah, um, yeah, adjusted to, to new requirements, for instance, or new services if you want to use them. And so you have new actors like this new teams here. You have new actors in business, because business now knows that everything is possible from IT perspective. Uh, everything is possible, and if the, the internal IT isn't able to deliver, uh, they buy it as is us, or they are looking for, it for another supply, and he is able to deliver. So somewhere has to be someone who brings all of that stuff together. Yeah. Thank you. We are just below the 10 minutes mark. Yes, question from the audience. Multiple uh, providers work to, uh, together. How uh, can you uh, secure? Um, uh, can you provide security for for small and medium enterprises? How how do they handle this? Take us. 
will we start again on Robin Lomas Villano go or? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the, the topic of security is, is like a very, a very large one, right? So when it comes down to, uh, to SMEs, there are, so there are multiple areas. There is the, obviously the, on the corporate side uh, where you need to educate your, your employees and you need to, need to make sure like everything starts with awareness. If you move on the technical perspective, again, uh, there is this, I think, what we see, again, like in Canonical in particular, there is this misconception that uh, you, you know, you get a VM on the cloud or you stand up like a, uh, like a Kubernetes in the cloud and like everything is like magically secure. I mean, actually that is like far from, from the truth. And uh, there are multiple layers there that need to be looked at individually and also like as a, as a continuum. Uh, so, I mean, of course, we like I think each one of our organizations just can tackle like one at a time. But then it's up to you know yourself or the technical people within your organization to take a step back and, uh, uh, and, and actually assess um, assess everything. In doing so, there is an initiative that unfortunately Europe has not picked up yet, but obviously the US is championing that is the like SBOM. So actually understanding what is part of your infrastructure. SBOM is the standardized building material, uh, just like with the uh, um, cybersecurity app uh, of I think last May. Um, and and again, I think if it will eventually be picked up also by the, the cloud providers here at the scale and like at least Having visibility of what you're running is the first step of understanding what you need to protect. Uh, I mean, we are working on that, the clouds are working on that, so hopefully we will see something tangible in the next couple of months. Well, I think security, you know, in the cloud, if you if you take you know the idea that you move your workload into a public public cloud, is it's basically very similar but similar to what you've done, you know, on, in your private cloud. First of all, you just Lock everything out and just let through what, whatever services you want to expose. I mean, that's that hasn't changed. However, the additional layers depends on who manages that layer, and it, it boils down to. Now I'm talking about the operational perspective because application delivery has its own risks. Let's say build uh, secure container images and, and how to keep them secure. But in general, if you think about software lifecycle in both operation and development. You know, how do you how do you update? Let's say there's a CVE, there's a security vulnerable a vulnerability out there, and you want to fix it. You need to be quick in adopting your software and, and deliver that into your production environment. That's if you if you manage to have that delivery chain in a in an automated you know, fashion, then you can also be more secure because you can respond to those CVEs much faster. So again, if, if you have a, a tool chain that's fully automated, let's say for example database upgrades, if you manage to have no downtimes for database upgrades and you would be able to deliver uh, patch level upgrades automatically in an unattended way, that will give you faster time to a uh, faster response time and hence more security. So there are many other perspectives on this, but I think managing your life cycle automatically also increases security. Yes, so I agree to what you said because um, not at least with the cloud business but especially with the cloud business we are now in the zero trust environments. So yeah, don't trust anything. So uh, consider every possibility how to secure your environment from the beginning. That's our business. And the second part is you can only face all of the security and uh, regulatory requirements by automation. Yeah, otherwise it will never be possible. And that's the reason why you have to bring it into code, why we are dealing with modules, with standards who already consider that yeah, for deploying some infrastructures on Azure, AWS and so on. There are standards that can be used, yeah? use them. But you will go up and up into these different levels where suddenly no standard is available. Then you have to develop exactly that for your purpose, for your company, for your whatever you're working for. Yeah, but even for the first step into using all of that uh, cloud stuff, there are existing modules that should be used even to accelerate your business, your first steps. Yeah, but yeah, this is something I think where we all have to grow in because all of this uh, uh, yeah, requirements that we have from security part or, or GSC part, they changed even in the last months or years. Sometimes it's new for us 
and we have to find new modules or others as well. And uh, they will not stop uh, changing their requirements on different, uh, different business. So it is an ongoing task always working on that. But automation is the way how to face all of the issues. Otherwise, it will not be managed. Thank you. Then, Enrique? Well, uh, my position here is a uh, Well, I, I must confess that uh, we rely on Panda security. And, uh, when we are talking to them, they just say that uh, whenever we just manage to have all the systems updated with the latest version, because they are able just, they even just say that due to this cloud computing, they are able just to get information so that they detect the threats uh, before they really happen, that they really destroy your data. So they, uh, they just by saying, okay, hey, if you have everything, yes, uh, with the latest versions, even the operating systems, uh, you might be always in the same state. Okay. Uh, but on the other, <laughs> well, I don't know yeah. if I had to say this. <laughs> But uh, one of the things that we do here with our assistance is just to, uh, to collect the user traffic with this exchange between the operators and the users. And, uh, and then when it comes here, the feeling of security. Sometimes it's not security itself, but it's the feeling that you feel secure. Uh, in, with, with our system, we are able just to capture the, uh, the encryption keys. Yeah, so, so we are able just to decrypt the traffic. Okay. Of course, if it is for Leo, of course. Okay. <laughs> it's not, it's everything. It's not a... But uh, I mean, uh, so this is the, co the combination from uh, what uh, when we talk, if it, if it, uh, we say, for example, say, you know, this is uh, secure by design, okay? But then something comes and this puts it in the middle and grabs the, the information requires uh, to connect to the traffic, okay? put it in clear place. So at the end, security is as long as you feel secure, as long as uh, there is this sense of security. Uh, but they say security is not forever. Okay. It's just mean for as long as your privacy data is valuable. If someone is just taking the, the value afterwards, then you don't care. You need to be secure that for the time that I need the value to be secure, this, this, this data is secure. Yeah, it's like a QoE for, for security, yeah, right? And uh, yeah, you correctly say it. It's adapted to the to the perceived value and the time uh, window where the data must be must be secure. So I think we are uh, coming to a close. Thanks uh, to all the audience and especially for the questions. Thanks really a lot to our four new panelists that provided a very interesting and multifaceted view as we were hoping in this in this uh, uh, session on on startup and SMEs. And I would just like to uh, remind everyone of the next uh, step. So uh, now we have lunch break uh, and at one we come back uh, with uh, a presentation session uh, on the trends and roadmap in the research in computing continuum because uh, this is of course uh, the, the business research innovation. It's, uh, it's also another dimension of continuum from innovation down to down to market entities. So thanks again for uh, coming and uh, enjoy your break and um, lunch and see you again at uh, one. Thank you.